They did a wonderful job all last week with Vacation Bible School, and they've done a great job this morning. I thank them for being so participatory. Amen? Amen. 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 With my people. King Solomon had asked God to make provisions for the people right. when they had sinned, and they had done much of it, just like we had. And after months of waiting for an answer from the Lord, God answered with four conditions that would bring about a revival and restore their relationship with him. Because that's why we're created, Amen. to have a relationship with the Lord. Right. We're not created to have fun. Amen. We're not created to be happy. Right. Happiness Amen. comes from the world. The joy comes from God. Amen. But we were created have a relationship with the Lord. So God said, in order for the kingdom to continue, you must, one, humble yourselves by admitting your sins. All right. Two, pray to God asking for forgiveness. Three, seek God's face. Right. And four, turn from sinful behavior. Mount Calvary, we need a revival. All right. We need to be reunited as a church. Yeah. We've been going through some stuff. Right. And the stuff didn't start six months ago when our pastor left. Yeah. It started a long time ago. The enemy has been attacking yes. the church, not just here about Calvary, yes. but all over the world. Yes. But God, but God is greater than the enemy. Greater is he that is in me than he is in the world. Mount Calvary, our survival as a church is dependent upon our obedience to God. I said our survival as a church is dependent upon our obedience to God yeah. as individuals and as the church united. I've entitled this message, Revival, the key to survival. All right. Let us pray. Right. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning with humbled hearts and with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts for you and only you, dear God, because you are the only one who deserves all the honor all the glory and all the worship and all the praise. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to see another day. We thank you for allowing us, Lord, to have a house of prayer to come to. Because somewhere in this world, people are hiding to read your word and yeah. to study your word. So we thank you for this house of prayer. Yeah. We thank you for our congregation. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done from our Calvary and all that you will do. Yes. Heavenly Father, we ask now that you bless your word that you've given your servant. And Lord, whatever you have to do to me to make me deliver it, turn me upside down if you have to, Lord. But when I'm right side up again and I open my mouth, let nothing proceed from my mouth but, but the pure, unadulterated words from you. Yeah. We pray for the sick. We pray for those who would like to be here but unable to be here. We pray for the bereaved. We pray for Sister Jones who is this weekend going to bury her father. We pray for all the bereaved. We pray for all the widows. And we Father, we give all thanks and we ask for these blessings. In the mighty and matchless name of your son, Jesus, who is the Christ, and all your children can say, Amen. 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 Revival happens when God visits his people and he wakes them up spiritually. Now, you know, I'm not much on jokes and stories in my sermons, but I want to share a true story with you. One particular Sunday, there was a preacher. He was preaching a powerful sermon about hell and how terrible hell would be. In the congregation, there was this fellow who fell asleep every Sunday. And the preacher came to a point when he pounded the pulpit 
emphasize how bad hell was. And he said, if anyone wants to go to hell, let him stand up right now. Well, the only part of the, that the sleeping guy heard was stand up right now. <laughs> so he did. He stood there for a few minutes and looked around. He said, well, preacher, I don't know what we just voted on, but it looks like you and I are the only ones for it. <laughs> Beloved, if we want a true revival here in Mount Calvary, if we want God to heal our land, if we want to be restored to what God had in mind for the church from the beginning, if we want to truly get off to a godly start with our new pastor and the new congregation merging in, it is incumbent upon you and me to follow the same instruction that God gave his people under Solomon. We're going to have to humble ourselves. Right. We're going to have to pray. Yeah. We have to see God's yeah. face and we're going to have to turn right. from our wicked yeah. ways. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, sister. Call it like it is. Things that we know that are not pleasing to God, we've got to turn from them. Yeah. Ways that are destructive to the moving this church forward, yeah. we've got to turn away from them. Before I delve into these four conditions that are listed in your bulletin, I want to level the playing field. God's promises are for his people. They're for his people. Because he said, if my people. God is speaking to his people, his people, no one else. How can you be sure that you're one of God's people? John 14, 34 says, a new commandment I give you. Yes, yes. Love one another. Amen. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. If you're not showing love to God's people, in God's house especially, perhaps you're not one of God's people. I know scripture says, judge not lest ye be judged. You're right. We're not to judge one another, but we're to judge one another's behavior and confront it and help them. Right. Right. Not talk about it and sweep yeah. it under the rug. Yeah. When I observe some of the backbiting, bickering, yeah. the seeds of discord being sown in this church, right. jockeying for position, yeah. Yeah. I can't help but wonder, is he saying? This is God's people yeah. acting like that. Yeah. Oh, Dr. Davis, you, yeah. I'm about to air out some dirty laundry. Oh. 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 And it goes for me too. <clears throat> I preach to myself when I'm putting my sermon together. I'm going out, Lord. All right. That's the problem. We've been playing the ostrich, sticking our head in the sand, and our backside is all out and exposed. <laughs> Thank God I'm saved because I'm going to sit in a different way. Instead of criticizing one another, we need to face our problem. Amen. Deal with them according to scripture. Yes. Matthew chapter 18 is for Christians, not unbelievers. Yeah. In Matthew 18, God instructs us step by step mm -hmm. as to how we should settle our differences. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't say start a destructive gossip campaign. Mm. Right. It doesn't say duke it out with him. It doesn't say gather up a posse to persecute him or her. It says that after airing your problem, the point is reconciliation. Yeah. The goal yeah. is reconciliation, to restore harmony and relationship. Because he said, who are called? If my people who are called by my name. When we came to Christ, we became associated with his name. Amen? Amen. We became Christians. Amen. Every single person who claims to know Jesus either, either lifts his name up or tears his name down. Amen. VBS was lifting his name up a little while ago. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we either lift his name up or we tear it down. God calls us out from the world. Right. I said, God calls us out from the world. 
John 17, 15 says, we are in the world that is physically present, but not of it. Not part of the world's values and behavior. Being a Christian means that we are meant to stand out All right. from the world, from the rest of the world. We're to live differently than the world. Like God's kids. We're supposed to be like God's kids, not baby's kids. <laughs> we are known by a new name. We are new creations if any man be in Christ. That's right. It's a new creature. Old things passed away. And behold, all things become brand new. We're given the opportunity to live a transformed life. Romans 12 tells us, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's the least you can do. If Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood, that's the least we can do. Let's transform our lives. Some of us need to either change our behavior change our name. Because we are royalty. I didn't say it. God says it. First Peter 2 9 said you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. A holy nation. If we're kings and queens, if we're princes and princesses, why do we sometimes display the unruly behavior of commoners or unbelievers? Come on. Christian, acting like the world. Yeah. I know that there's a fine line between waiting on the Lord and pushing through with our own agenda. Right. Remember Exodus? <coughs> While Moses was up on the mountain of Sinai, yeah, yeah. communing with God, receiving the law, what was happening down in the camp at the foot of Mount Sinai? Impatient. Impatient. Yeah. Thank you, sister. The people were getting restless. Say the natives were rest restless. And they told Aaron, forget Moses. That man who brought us out of Egypt out here. Forget him. We don't know what became of him. So they give Aaron their gold earrings. And he makes a golden calf. And they worship it. Right. These same people with this same behavior, kept Moses from entering the promised land because they badgered him so much that he disobeyed God. Mount Calvary, this is personal. Our transition in waiting for God to send us a pastor, unfortunately, parallels the Israelites' behavior. Amen. Yes. Amen. <laughs> My toes are hurting too. Six months is not a long time mm -hmm. to select a pastor. Kevin Litchfield, our interim pastor, has been the interim pastor also for a church out in Menor, Amen. Trinity Baptist Church. Amen. For over a year, they finally came up with a candidate. I'm telling you the truth. They came up with a candidate, and they voted on it. He got 60%, which is enough to get him in, but he turned it down. He said, that's too divided. It's not much better than 50-50. He said, I'm not walking into a situation that much divided. So he moved on. Guess what? They're back to the drawing board. We've done it in six months. Some of you have been over anxious. Some of you have been impatient. All right. Some of you have been contrary. And some of you have been downright nasty. Amen. Downright nasty to your fellow members. All right. Every church has its little chicken fight. We've gone from chicken fighting to downright smiling alley cat fight. But believers, who trust in the Lord with all their heart and not to their own understanding and always acknowledge him, guess what? They wait to right. direct their paths. Right. I'm, go I'm going out on a limb now. I'm going deep in this The buzzword around here, we need more than one candidate to choose from. Or 
your information. And I'm not divulging anything that should be secret. Okay? That's right. For your information, there was more than one. There were three others. Two of them, I developed a new respect for the search committee when I found out they didn't even present them to us. They weren't even going to think about presenting to us. And the other one didn't fit the, the, the job either. So there were four. The makeup of, of, the, the, makeup of the search committee was criticized. If I were choosing, I perhaps would have chosen five of them that was on it. recognize what God says are the conditions for revival. And I'm going to start with number one, humility. Humility. I would like for you to look at your programs and recite 1 Peter 1, I mean, 1 Peter 5, verses 5 and 6. You ready? It's in your bulletin. You don't have to really look in your sword. It's in your bulletin. It says, for God, let us say it together, for God resisted the proud and gave grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. Now we're going to have class right now. So we're going to exegete, we're going to dissect this, this scripture. Not maybe word for word, but almost. First of all, I want to ask, what is the opposite of being humble? Mm -hmm. Proud. Being yeah, pride. Being proud. Being proud. Pride. What does it say he does to the proud? What does it say? What does the scripture say he does? He resists them. He gives them a whooping. He gives them a whooping. If you've been to the, a woodshed, if you've been to God's woodshed. Yeah. Right. Satan got kicked out of heaven because he forgot who had given him his beauty, right. his intelligence, yeah. his position, and his power. <laughs> he forgot the ways he came, the power that he was operating on. He forgot. He brought that pump into town. <laughs> got to be kicked out of hell. Pride perverted Satan's thinking like it perverts ours sometimes. It perverted his thinking into rejecting the dependence upon God 
And he elevated himself above God. Mm. Yeah. Adam and Eve. It was pride. Right. Yes. The God kicked out of the garden. <laughs> I asked you, beloved, what do we have? What do you and I have, I have that we did not receive? Maybe we came in this world, and maybe we will return. Amen. And every good and perfect gift comes from above. Amen. Oh, but what is he going to give to the humble? Look back at the, look at the scripture here. What is he going to do to the humble? He's going he's to give them something. What, what does he say? He's going to give them? Grace. Grace. He's going to give you something you don't deserve. Amen. Something you cannot earn, which is forgiveness and eternal life. Instead of giving you what you do deserve, which is hell and damnation, he gives you grace. And so he says, therefore, humble yourselves. Admit who's in charge. Admit who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Admit who owns the hills. Admit who, never, who will never leave you nor forsake you. Admit who supplies all your needs according to his riches in glory. Admit through whom you can do all things. The price is strict and Jew. And it says, in due time. That means in God's season, in God's time, he's not on your watch. We're on his. In due season. It may not be your season. And I just, my, my, my biological clock is ticking, so I just need to get married. It may not still be your season to get married. <laughs> Wait on God. Well, I want this, I want that. You know what? You need to be on your knees talking to God. Constantly about it. Without an attitude. Because to everything, there is a season. And then I see that word exalt in that scripture. It says, he will exalt you. If you humble yourself. It says he will exalt you. He will raise your status. He will raise your power, your, your position. Jeremiah 29 11 says, I know the plans I have. Amen. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope yeah. and a future. He yeah. knows that for each one of us. That goes to every one of us. Yeah. God says, leave it to me. It says, casting all your cares, leave it to me. Come unto me, all of you that labor and are heavily laden. I will give you what? Rest. Yes. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I said, give it to me. Give it to me. And he says, admit your sin. Don't be too proud. I know him already. I already know him. I know you. And I planted goodness in you. in you. And he says that, guess what, that goodness is still there. No matter what you've done wrong, That's that right. goodness that he created in you, it is still there. Yeah. He says in Philippians 1, says, be confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you is faithful yeah. to carry on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. When God starts a project, he finishes it. Yeah. He carries it throughout our lives and will finish it when we meet him face to Amen. The whole trinity is on your case. Each one of you. The whole trinity is working for you. That's how important you are to God. Amen. God's work for you began when Christ died on the cross. His work for you began then. His work in you began when you believed and accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Yeah. And now the Holy Spirit lives in you to enable you. Yeah. To become more Christ-like every day. Yeah. That's the process of Christian growth right. and maturity. Amen. Check us out on Sunday and Wednesday over the week. Amen. Check Minister Ray and I out. Amen. It all starts with being humble. Yeah. In several scriptures, Jesus calls on us to turn from our proud ways and become like children. All right. Matthew 18, 3, it's in your bulletin. It says, unless you turn. And become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. A baby has faith that it will be fed, yes, right. clothed, and provided for yes. each and every day. Amen. A baby puts its hope and confidence in someone other than itself. Yes. Every single moment of the day, a baby is wholly leaning 
and depending on someone else to provide for him. Yeah, that's right. In a word, a baby is humble because he looks to something outside of him All right. for what he needs to survive. Yeah. God wants us to be the same way. James, John 1, 5, 5 says, if I, he says, I am the vine. Mm -hmm. You are the branches. And apart from me, you can do nothing. A child is utterly dependent on its parents. And that is what God wants from you and me. Jesus wants us to be without pretense. Be real when we come to him. Instead, we often try to be something we aren't. We try to be so, so religious and so spiritual. We just want to get, get it right. You didn't have to clean yourself up to get saved. Why do you think you got to clean yourself up to go to, to the Lord? Right. When, especially when it comes to praying and talking to Him. Why put this mask on? He, Jesus doesn't want you coming with a mask. He wants to come just as you are, messy. Amen. Yeah, I said messy. Uh -huh. Just come messy, just like you are. Don't try to get the prayer right. Well, let me see what I can say. This. No, don't write out. No, just come to the Lord. Just come to the Lord. Say what's on your mind. That's what little children do. That's why they're so precious. They say what's on their mind. That's the way God wants us. The only way to come to God is to take off our spiritual masks. The real you has to meet the real God. Amen. When we humble ourselves, we're literally saying to God, you're in control of my life. Mm -hmm. Pride sings the song, how great I am. <laughs> Humility sings how great God is. Pride refuses to worship and give God glory and honor. But humility is unashamed to praise honor and glory. King David told his wife, and she criticized him for praising God and dancing in the street because the ark was coming home. He said, you think that was something? You ain't seen nothing yet. I'm going really, to really put a show on you now. Because I'm going to praise my God for bringing it home. Amen. Pride is concerned with what other th people think. Humility is concerned only with what God thinks. Yeah. Humble people bless their food in a restaurant. Yeah. 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 Don't care who's looking. Yeah. 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 Pride refuses to call for help. Yeah. Humility asks God for help. Yeah. Humility says, it's me, it's me. It's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. <clears throat> if that not been for the Lord on my side, All right. where would I be? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Pride makes its own way. Humility chooses God's way. Pride wants the credit for good things done. Humility gives God all the credit, all the honor, yes. and all the glory. Yes. In a nutshell, to be humble means to be brought low. Submissive. Surrender to God. To allow yourself to be bent by God. Number two. And pray. You won't have your life in my cabin without prayer. The corporate prayer ministry, hear me, the corporate prayer ministry of the church should be the most important, influential, and prominently emphasized ministry of the church. I knew it wouldn't get a whole lot of you. Yet, in almost all churches, prayer is on the back burner. Prayer meeting is the most unpopular meeting of the week. Satan's greatest aim is to destroy our prayer line. Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint on his knees. Satan doesn't mind you coming to church. He don't have a problem with that. Satan don't even mind you reading your Bible. Satan don't mind you doing church work. But when the devil sees a man or a woman who really prays, who really believes in prayer,
prayer, knows how to pray, and does does pray above anything else, he has a nervous breakdown. Amen. Especially if he sees a whole church on his knees. Yeah. Well, he's a loner because he knows that church won't make a difference in that community. Amen. Through corporate prayer, God can empower and bless the other ministries of the church. Amen. And all ministries in the church need to be accountable to the prayer ministry. Amen. Amen. Let me say it again. Amen. All other ministries, yes. no matter what they are, of the church should be accountable to the prayer ministry. They should be a part of it. Amen. Somebody from your organization ought to be representing that group at prayer meeting. I'm sorry. I mean, you ought to be there. All of you should be there, but there should be some representation. From every ministry in the church at prayer meeting. Amen. Matthew 18, 19, and 20 says, Again, I say to you, it's in your bulletin. I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Amen. Amen. Saints, the church was born. upper room. Yeah. The birth of the church came when the disciples were gathered on their knees in a prayer meeting. Yeah. Acts 1 14 says they all joined. Not some of them. Not six of them. But it says they all joined together in prayer constantly. Yeah. Amen. What happened to us? Admit it. Prayer continues to be the weakest link here at Mount Calvary. Yeah. The reason I can say it is because I'm in prayer meeting every Wednesday. And I know. I know who's here and who's not here. And I know the faithful five or six. Sometimes it's four. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yes. Lord have mercy, Jesus. Amen. Amen. But Mount Calvary, have we forgotten? Have we forgotten that every successful thing that has happened in Mount Calvary and for Mount Calvary was birth and prayer? Amen. Money didn't build this church. Amen. Prayer Amen. built this church. Amen. Prayer. Yeah, yeah. This church. Mount Calvary, you should remember the Alamo of 2006. Yeah. 2005, rather. Yeah. Alamo. When we got ready to build this church, and the then mayor coach said, Ain't no way in hell you're going to build a black church in Metro. Amen. Amen. What he didn't know was, we weren't trying to build it in hell. We were trying to build it in heaven. <laughs> From start to finish, it was a struggle. Yeah. Did you know it was a struggle? Yeah. Every monkey wrench and obstacle possible was thrown yeah. at us. Mm -hmm. But Pastor Evers kept encouraging us to stay on our knees and yeah. pray. Yeah. Each time they call in the city hall, we'd go with it. Yeah. Some of us would stand outside and pray while he was in there being yeah. tortured. And some of us were in there watching it happen. Amen. That was a Goliath. We had a neighbor back here who put a big Confederate flag in the window. Yeah. And we had another woman over there across the street. Someone said, well, what? Why you got a problem with a church being built? Why you going to the church there? She said, I don't want to look at you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's what the bigot say. She said, I don't want to look at you. Mm -hmm. But guess what? Prayer prevailed. Yeah. Yeah. Prayer yeah. prevailed. Yeah. And if we're going to see a spiritual revival here in Mount Calvary, it, it will come about as a result of us being on our knees and praying. Yeah. It's going to happen with, with prayer, not preaching, not teaching, yeah. not church activities, but it's going to happen through prayer. God is not waiting for the world to turn to him in repentance. He's not waiting for the leaders in Washington to seek his counsel. He's waiting for the church everywhere Amen. to get on her knees right. and pray. We struggle to gather a handful of people to pray for an hour once a week, mm -hmm. half hour. But let Beyonce or Kenny G or Kim Ho come. <laughs> Roxino will be packed. 
And the lottery lions don't suffer on Wednesday between 6 and 7 and 8 o'clock when you should be here and you're in the lottery line. Just telling you like it is. The church today does not see God moving because we have stopped seeking God. When we do pray, sometimes we're asking for the wrong thing, for the wrong reasons, according to our watch, not God. James 4, 2, 3 says, you do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you, when you ask, you ask it for the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Prayer changes things. What we do on the ground in prayer determines what happens in the air. Number three. Seek my face. Right. God calls on us to seek his face. And we know that God doesn't literally have a face. He has no body. God is spirit. As John 4, 24 says, God is spirit. And they who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Yet, in Jeremiah 29, 13, God promises you will seek me. And find me when you seek me with all your heart. heart. Mm -hmm. How do you seek God, beloved? How do you seek God? Do you just seek God's hand for what he can give you? Do you just seek him for how he can change your life for the better? Or do you seek his face because of who he is? Do you seek his essence, his being? Have you taken the time to explore God's ten attributes, his sovereignty, his eternal existence, his omniscience, his omnipotence, his omnipresence, his veracity, his immutability, his love, his righteousness, his justice. Do you seek him? The problem is most people are seeking God, are seeking his hands not his heart, Amen. and not his mind. Seek the mind of God, and you, you, you see his face. They're seeking God for what he can do for them. Their prayers to him consist of please heal, please give, please fix. Yes. This is not seeking God. You're supposed to present supplications and present your needs. But that is not seeking him. That's right. It's not seeking his face. In seeking God's face, we shouldn't be looking for results. We should be seeking him for joy of who he is and seeking to abide in him. He said, you abide in me. And my words abide in you. You can ask anything. Amen. To see God's face, we have to step out of our daily routine. Mm -hmm. We gotta step out of our little comfort zone. Yeah. We gotta choose a special time, let everything else go. Yeah. But him. Right. First John 2, 15 and 17 said, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Yeah. Amen. Right. The world and its desires pass away. But the man who does the will of God lives forever. Yeah. In heaven, too, not heaven, hell. If we're holding on to earthly things, we'll never step into heavenly things. Isaiah 52, 59, 2 says, But your iniquities have separated you from me. They have hidden my face from you so that he will not hear. When we see God's face, it's all about him, not yeah. us. Yeah. We spend some time with him. He must be, become greater, we must become less. John 3 30 says, Do you worship him for who he is rather than what he can do for you? Psalm 37 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Jesus said in his Beatitudes that the pure in heart will see God. Number four, last one. Turn from your wicked ways, and I know we don't like this. 
1 John 1 9 says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins. And to do what? To cleanse you from unrighteousness. Some of us don't want to be cleaned up. I had a teenager here recently and told me, I know it's wrong, but I, I just like to do it. And I pray, I pray with him. But she's no different. You want to blame everything on kids? We adults? Amen. We old folks? But we can't hang on to things that God hates and expect things to be right with us and him and expect him to restore us. You may have to get rid of something. You may have to get rid of somebody in order to make this turn. But it'll be worth the sacrifice. Because they weren't worth it in the beginning. Because if they were, they wouldn't have been telling you about Jesus. Whatever is making you hang on to the works of the flesh, and then this is in Galatia. Adultery and fornication are in the lead. But we have desire. Yes, you have desire. God gave me this. Yes, you did give me desire. But there's a difference in desire and lust. Right. Lust is desire out of control. Lust is from the world. Mm -hmm. This flesh is rotten. Yeah. It's rotten to the core. Yeah. Paul says, I know that dwells in me no good things. He told the truth. This flesh will tell you that it's all right to lay up with someone you're not married to. Mm -hmm. And we'll get quiet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> God created sex, yes he did. And he also established an institution to govern it and called marriage. Every child that is brought into this world deserves that covering. Every child that comes into the world deserves that covering that God created for them. Mama don't tell you, Daddy don't tell you, Grandma don't tell you, Grandpa don't tell you, Amy don't tell you, I'm telling you. Because I'm not going to get a whoop from God, you're not telling me. Because God will hold it against me for not telling you. Sexual immorality, though, is not the only thing we need to turn from. Lying, we need to turn from lying. Yeah. Stealing, yeah. gossiping, yeah. deceit, yeah. trickery, yeah. meanness, yeah. laziness. Okay. All those keep us from being restored to a relationship with God and will prevent us from enjoying a revival. Yeah. Get rid of them. Amen. Yeah. The Bible says, forsake them. Yeah. God said, I'll forgive you and I'll heal your land. How do we forsake these wicked ways? Paul said, I die daily. Mm -hmm. Paul said, I die daily. Kill it. Remember, it means you have to die to self daily. We love self so much. But you have to kill self. You got to kill flesh. I mean, you commit suicide, but you got to kill this, this lustful desires. You gotta kill this meanness. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you don't, if you don't kill it, you don't die daily. That's how good Christians, good Christians, saved people who love the Lord end up committing adultery, fornication, cheating, lying, getting in bondage with drugs, alcohol, <coughs> food. Mm -hmm. We don't control our flesh. We can't control who we in faith that we don't need mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. We eat when we're not even hungry. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Half the thing you take the medicine for is because you overindulge. Yeah. Some kind of way. It includes gambling. Right. Yeah. Right. Then you got a baby. <laughs> you got horseshoe. You got racing. Roxy, you know. Some of you still get on there. 
flag buses or board buses up and get to Greek town and the casinos. When you're gambling, you're telling God, I don't trust you. I can't trust you. Supply everything I need. So I, 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 I gotta try my hand. I gotta try my hand with the dice. Greed on anything, not just food, money, greed. Anything else that people become enslaved to. That's right. Gotta kill the flesh so you don't fall into it. Can we walk this thing on home now? The very word revival says that something is alive, but it is about to die. It needs to be awakened. Mount Calvary, how badly do you want to revive? How badly do you want to get this church right? All right. With God. Not according to your agenda, but right in God. Right. One of the major reasons why churches in America are not seeing a movement of God is because they don't want it badly enough. And they set up for mediocrity. They don't want it bad enough because they got to pay a price. Revival comes with a price. All right. But if we obey 2 Chronicles 7 14, if my people, know the rest. If we obey that, 1 mm -hmm. Corinthians 2 promises that I have not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man. All the things that God has prepared for them who love him. When are we going to start trusting? When are we going to start trusting him? The Lord says, there's nothing too hard for him. Amen. In Jeremiah 32, 27, he said, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? Yeah. If God could resurrect his son, yeah. he could resurrect, he could revive his church. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we've all read, you know, seven last words <laughs> of a dying church. We have always Get ready to be bent. Because God's going to bend us. He's going to change us. And I know nothing, nobody wants to change but a wet baby. But God is getting ready to change us. Ready to do something. He's going to change it for the best. Because all things work together for the good of those who love God and call according to his purpose.
the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And when you are alive, remain. So we call it together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now I get too excited. Oh, great. Where is that victory? Oh, death, where is the sting? There's no sting of it. Because we have a Savior who is alive. Amen? Amen. Amen. What can wash away? My sins, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me cool again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. No precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other time I know nothing but the blood of Jesus. The last, and did my Savior bleed? Did my sovereign die? Would he forsake that sacred head for such a worm? Cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there, it was there right by faith, that I received my sight, and now I'm happy all the day. There is a fountain, there is a fountain, filled with blood, drawn from yeah. and sinners plunged beneath that flood. They was all. At the cross. Yeah. At the cross. Yeah. 